There we go. I hope we're on. I hope we are live. Um, the, the, the miracles of technology, I think we're coming from different places all over the world, different time zones. I am actually back in Los Angeles, and we just had daylight savings time switch not too long ago. So trying to get all of the calendars and everything caught up is always a challenge. But uh, excited for everybody that joins the the topic today, we're going to do the perfunctory introduce yourself on the panel here in a minute. But any of you that are joining know that what we're talking about is sort of, you know, cryptocurrency, what's going on within the, the market, the Asian nations, primarily a lot of people are, are, are tracking China, but there there's some fascinating things going on in, in what is or isn't Hong Kong. That's sort of up for debate, uh, South Korea and a lot of the other jurisdictions a lot's going on around the world so we're going to start with the introductions as i said evan let's jump in with you give us the 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 background and introduction and then we'll we'll jump to addy now good morning from hong kong um i am evan and uh, great to be here uh, i am currently the president of any mocha brands we are a company that facilitates the ecosystem of true pro property rights for uh digital the true digital property rights. So we make NFTs, uh, uh, you know, growing very, very rapidly at this point in time, game ecosystems, uh, and that's what we do on the blockchain. My background is, uh, you know, now that in cryptocurrency, I actually started my career in foreign exchange, uh, which is, uh, you know, not, not it's a regular currencies. Uh, and then uh, I went into treasury and derivatives before becoming a management consultant in, uh, at McKinsey and then uh, left to run buses uh, in Hong Kong, uh, and then uh, and uh, Gerson Lerman Group, which is an expert network, before uh, landing here at Animoca. Uh, I, I suppose uh, I'm also uh, on a bunch of other nonprofit uh, organizations in sustainability, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Great to be here today. Perfect, thank you. Adi, let's jump over to you. Hello, everybody. Uh, hello from Mumbai, which I'm here for a very temporary <laughs> base, but, you know, adding to the five, uh, 545 a.m. time zone group. Um, uh, you know, from an old family business in India, we do a, a large number of cross-border uh, border transactions. So we're always deeply impacted on how the banking system changes, how currencies evolve. Uh, primarily in the in the classic trading, pharmaceuticals, chemicals space, we also run a number of uh, different companies in verticals in healthcare and education. Uh, my personal interest comes from uh, you know I was at uh, Stanford University as an undergrad, which I drank the tech Kool Aid. Uh, then at Harvard Business School, uh, we are considered one of the leaders in the Asia Pacific in the use of cloud computing. Uh, and that's where I sort of got my bug of entire entire looking at uh, digital currencies, crypto transactions. Uh, we are definitely an older world company still there, but uh, we really see the need uh, as we look at cross border transactions, as we look at de risking in our portfolio in in different countries in Asia and the Middle East on 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 how we see uh, uh, banking happen. Pleasure to be here. Perfect, great. Thank you so much, Tom. Hello, everybody. My name is Tom Ludescher. Greetings from Zurich, Switzerland. It's one degrees here, so I'm probably in the earliest time zone of this panel today. It's 1.15. Um, I have a background uh, in corporate finance, in insurance and in banking. I have a PhD in financial markets regulations, and for me it has always been very exciting to see new instruments coming on the market that basically fix some of the main issues of the global financial systems. Definitely CBDCs that we are deep diving into today is one of the most exciting topics here because this is then really where not the Wild West, but the regulated financial world meets new technology. And that's a very interesting space to be in. So glad to be on this panel. Yeah, perfect, Tom. Uh, the, the good news is I think we will each have a little bit more time based on the, the panelists we have here. Uh, so I'm actually going to take a start on this and do a distinction because even the write-up, the way the write-up for this panel is, it says China may be the first Asian nation to offer a cryptocurrency. And and I'm going to start the entire dispute. I was just on a panel in Malta, and I basically said there's no such thing as a cryptocurrency for banks. I, and what I did just, and I think this will help the panel as well, and I did a distinction. I said all money is not equal. Fiat money is, it might be paper or coins. A debit card is a retail for consumers, which is still digital. 
but use a debit card to pay your for your coffee. You use bank settlement, SWIFT, Fedwire, ACH, still money, still digital, but that's a bank tool for money. You've got gift cards, which act like payment inside a closed network. You've got gold. You've got stocks. Cryptocurrencies, in my opinion, most cryptocurrencies are actually, they're glorified penny stocks. You buy it at 10 cents to sell it at a dollar, not buy a cup of coffee. And then if you've got a piece of real estate that goes public, but, you know, so this concept that banks should be quote, regulating cryptocurrency, I, I think the misnomer of terminology already has us in a spot. So that being said, I want to focus this one on either stable coins, which I think will act like a, a, a debit card product that I think banks will and, and should issue. And they'll come with their own set of programs and problems or CDBNs. So let's talk about central digital bank notes, because to me, that's going to be much more of a bank function than a, a currency and things like that. Um, I don't know where you guys want to start. So we'll go in reverse order. Tom, what's your what's your thoughts on what a cryptocurrency or a CDBN is or where does this fit within the bank ecosystem? I mean, it's when you when you look back in history a bit, how did it work? You had a very clear separation of responsibilities between the different market players. You had the central banks that were more looking into financial stability of the system that people trust. Uh, the overall system you have fairness when it comes to consumers. Um, you have uh, structural. Uh, components of the market that you need to have a look at and over the years they uh, moved more into risk management and, uh, and finally really looking about for solvencies everyone well capitalized and whatever was between uh, consumers and users of basically the money uh, this was left to the commercial banks and uh, that's still a system that works very very well and uh, what we have seen now with uh, the digital yuan and uh, China popping up is basically a completely new system where if you are using your uh, CBDC, then you're basically dealing with the central bank. And I think that's a, a new concept that uh, will probably not uh, go that far when you see already today's discussions. It all goes uh, more towards a, a dual T system uh, where the central bank still uh, can lean a little bit back and say, hey, I'm not getting too close. And if they don't get too close to the individual transactions, then all the hot topics that are debated about. Yeah traceability about uh, the central bank knowing what type of coffee you drink in the morning. I mean, this all becomes much less of a hot topic uh, if you basically try to fit new technology into an existing structure that is very well established. Yeah, and that's why I do the distinction between b digital bank settlement and a debit card, which is consumer. Adi, I see you're shaking your head. Let's Let's go to you for your well, um, Thank you. So, you know, I want to get a, to, to give a little bit of context here because at the end of the day, one of the problems I've always had, uh, which, uh, by the way, I love cryptocurrencies. I love the entire concept of them. But it's always a, at some point being a technology searching for a problem in some cases. Uh, and and I just I just want to take a step back and look at the context. right? And I, and I want to address not a country itself, but Asia. Uh, and even the Middle East and Africa as, a, as an ecosystem. There are a few things that have been happening. One, there's been a loss of trust in central banks. We look at what happened to Turkey and the lira. Uh, we've seen this time and time again where you have uh, businesses like us who do a lot of cross-border transactions, where we have massive currency exposures, where we're only flying and trying to settle uh, transactions in a few select yeah. currencies. And that's usually right now the US dollar, not even the euro. Second, uh, there is has been a... In my opinion, a rush to regulatory systems for banking to the bottom of the barrel, right? Where you have, you know, every week a new KYC norm coming out, there's new costs involved. If you look at SME banking, uh, e even though we have so called SWIFT 2.0, ACH, Fedwire, all these settlement mechanisms, uh, the actual cost to the end users has been going up and up and up. Uh, uh, foreign transaction fees have been going up. Uh, you know, banks have been loading on the costs for their regulations on the end. The, the type of questions that you get for every normal transaction, you know, you know, there's always, okay, why did you do this? We've done this a hundred times. Why are you asking now? On the other hand, I think even central banks aren't happy. They're seeing, if you, if you look at China, you had the entire shadow bank problem. You, we still have a lot of informal money lending and cross-border transactions as a reaction to what's happening in uh, in the banking economy. And that's in fact increasing. If you look at a country like India, post-demonetization, cash in the ecosystem 
has actually been going up at a staggering rate because banks are just unable to sort of capture the customer service that it is. And the central banks are frustrated because the levers, for example, quantitative easing that they're trying to do really understand where and what transactions are happening in the economies. So they lose that data as, as you go M1, M2, and you filter down through the banking system. So for me, the entire concept of a fiat-based digital currency is less about the tech on whether it's crypto or not crypto, whether it is through a ledger system. Or just digital. My point is there is no crypto, it's just digital. Exactly, or like a holding coin or, 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 or you know, delinked. But, but rather the notion where we have is that people are fed up dealing with currency risk and banking risk. And the only, the only settlement account right now they have is the U.S. dollar. The U.S. dollar, due to sanctions, which have happened for various political reasons, right or wrong, I am not going to debate the politics. But, you know, every year, guess what? Five countries are now on the sanction list. So many people are gray listed, often for very flimsy reasons. There is room for an alternative currency. Now, unfortunately, given the size of the digital market and, for example, you know, look what's happened to USDT uh, Tether, where it became a transient currency just between cryptos. Right. Um, Even if you do have a a, a cryptocurrency, only a few very strong central banks will have the, the, the trust, the credibility and the economic side to back it. China right now is in the lead. I think maybe India. I, I don't know if it's even Singapore could manage it, but obviously it ha- they have to tread carefully because we don't know where this will go. Here's, and, and I'm going to come in then, Evan, obviously you're so close to the fire in Hong Kong, but, but when, you, when you break down distinctions, if a bank issues a stable coin, that, that basically is your money's in the bank and it's based on currency. So if, a comp- if you get direct deposit from your company to your bank account and that money is still there, or if the bank does a central digital, that doesn't stop the vagrancy of the country issuing more of the central digital. Bitcoin's the only one with a built-in limiter. So this concept that oh, some central digital note's going to stop the inflationary pressure is a fallacy because there are no limits, even if it's a digital, you know, a central Even digital absolutely. bank, they're still going to press the inflation. Hell, hold on, Addy, let me hold that thought because I'll come back. Let me let me have Evan jump in, especially with Evan being so close in, you know, Hong Kong and what I would say close to the fire. You know, Evan, what are your thoughts? Well, you know, um, the, the the concept of a CBDC, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a crypto. It's a little bit different from what uh, the crypto community would consider as crypto, right? So, yeah. you know, you're going back to the whole concept of currency. I mean, you know, you get uh, ultimately what crypto is, is really heading toward a decentralized system. That's the most important, I mean, important concept in true, uh, uh, you know, decentralized world in crypto, which is really heading towards what we call bankless. So you see a podcast called Bankless, right? Um, and, and ultimately, uh, what it is, um, is that, uh, you know, I, I, I agree with Adi that, you know, there's a, there's a general problem of trust in the monetary system, especially with the worldwide, you know, many governments, especially in the Western world, printing money, right? And uh, and then uh, obviously, uh, uh, in the last few years, there seems to be some heading towards some degree of decoupling in economies. But in, in reality, economies never decouple because we're already so yeah. intertwined together, right? Now the, the 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 digital payments already exist, right? Uh, and as as Stephen you said, right? It's not like that. There's anything new here. What's the, what's the value add for all of this stuff, right? I mean, to to me, you know, what what this is, if you talk about CBDC for in, in particular, is really about you know, it's it's is really around. I don't know. It's really about the control monetary policy as much as about you know sort of an access and programmability, right? So you know. Um, uh, there, there are, you know, if you look at China, right, uh, for instance, especially given where I'm here, by the way, Hong Kong is very different from China, you know, even though it's still one country <laughs> within, yeah. within that, it's different, completely different monetary systems, but you look at the digital penetration in China in terms of payments, it's the highest in the world, right? So people don't carry wallets uh, in China. If you go to Shanghai or Beijing, they just carry their phones because, you know, if you take out your, if you go to like a, like a, you know, a restaurant and you kind of like, you, you, you take out your wallet, they're like, what are you doing? Right? Take out your phone and, you know, where's the WeChat pay, right? It's, it's really weird to be doing anything like that. So why, why is there still a push for uh, CBDC or, you know, digitized currency? Well, you know, the, the funny thing is that uh, uh, the banking penetration is lower than digital penetration, right, in, in many places. So 20% of the population still, like, not 
they don't have any banking services. As you issue CBDCs, you can go, you can go directly into onto your phone, your accounts, which phone penetration is very high in there. And of course, you know, if you care about control, and you know, I think all monetary authorities care about control. It is about traceability, right? And uh, you can talk about anti-laundering, uh, anti-money laundering. You're talking about you know things that are kind of like you know you can program it so that you can you can do certain you know certain things. Uh, uh, the default risk go down, etc. Right. So I think access is a big thing. I think uh, ultimately, you know, uh, the control uh, aspect is also a good thing. A uh, good thing. I mean, is a is a is a uh, is a is a, it's a, it's a, it's a that's a tool to be had, um, and uh, uh, and ultimately, you know, um, uh, I think uh, China in particular re really embraces uh, blockchain as a technology so to see what it can do. And as you, we all know, the elephant in the room is sort of, well, what what is the relation of China uh, with Western uh, nations, right? With uh, sanctions of U.S. and all that, uh, and uh, just because you have a new president that seems to be a little bit more, you know, open towards engagement in China, it doesn't mean that you know will always be that way with a new president yeah. or with a Republican Party coming back in. So, if you have this uh, payment gateway that is not reliant on SWIFT system, you could actually build these bridges that are not uh, going to be U.S. dollar line. And that's really important, right? It's not about China doesn't want to have like necessarily going to have a oh we want to re replace the U.S. dollars as, as a reserve currency. It's nearly impossible, right? Uh, at least not in the in the in the in the medium run. But what it does allow them to do is to uh, allow the uh, the transactions uh, that, that 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 can take place without dollar being in the middle of it. Yeah, let's talk about that for a minute, and, and Tom, I'll roll up to you, and then then back down to. Audio, and I'll, we'll kind of let you guys take the different lane because that's that's what I talk about with digital. I say your debit card's already digital, like the the, but it's not programmable. And as you mentioned, Evan, some of the program is around you know monetary policy and 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 money laundered, but it also can become more nefarious. I, I use the example in the U.S. that eventually we may end up all with free health care, you know, but with free comes limitations. Where if the government doesn't want you buying you know, a, a drink of alcohol after nine o'clock or more than one pack of cigarettes a month, you know, they, there's limits on, on the control. When money becomes programmable and control, I think the banks are much more interested in the control points than, than they are about some of the other ones. I, there's more, the banks have been fined more for money laundering than the amount of money laundering that's gone through crypto, you know, so the banks don't really want to solve that problem, but the governments want control. Uh, you know, let's roll up to, to Tom and then Adi will come back to you because we've got with the number of panelists, we have a lot more time. You know, Tom, where do you, where do you see it going in terms of why do you think the countries are interested in it and what's the good and the bad? I mean, from a, it's, it's at the end of the day, it's all about the data. And you sit on top of a system that basically has an auditable track record of whatever happened with um, your digital currency. Um, and it was used by the different uh, participants in the system. This is ex something extremely powerful. I mean, this is much better than in the past when you had credit card data or when you have e-wallet data and you try to figure out something useful from it. If you really have the big picture of your entire payment system, it's a whole new dimension of, of data accessible. And the question is now, who can do something good or bad with it? And I think we have heard terms like the uh, financial inclusion. Clearly, if you make a payment system more accessible, not only online, but also offline, that you can just link to phones and transfer um, the CBDC. Um, if you help people to have lower transaction costs, uh, finally payments, that's the, the lubricant of your um, of your trade, of your economy, if you make it cheaper, everyone wins at the end of the day. But in return, you know, there is a brutal transparency, a brutal traceability, and the one sitting on that data, he knows. And the question is, how do you control this? And the Chinese model with the digital yuan is clearly that the government uh, sits on top of the data and uh, they have the transparency. There are, however, also a different model how you can handle it, particularly with the two-tier models. You can basically say, okay, I put a, an, um, a controllable anonymity layer in between central bank and commercial bank. So technically, it's doable if you want to have more um, anonymity for the transactions, you can do it. And for me, the, the most exciting moment will be if we will have some of the more 
data protection um, in sophisticated countries like, for instance, Europe. When you take Europe with the euro, and the euro is the second largest reserve currency, it's the second largest trade finance currency, it's the second largest payment, global payment currency. So they're always following uh, closely or a little bit more behind the US dollar, but they have GDPR. And imagine now if you basically pair a fully traceable, a fully traceable uh, digital euro with the GDPR, very strict world leading data privacy rules. This is dynamite. And uh, yeah, I think it's also why, why Europe has just announced we are now starting to look into a digital euro earlier this year and they gave themselves a five year time horizon because this would be really a, a big, big task. But for me, this is the way to go. At the end of the day, you need to trust in the system as the other panelists have very well pointed out. And you can only fix that trust if you're not abusing the power of the data that you get. Yeah, and that's my joke as well. Like, cryptocurrency is not really a currency for most of it, and there's no such thing as a blocking company. At the end of the day, you're a company that uses blockchain, and, and that underlying technology is what enables all of these different programmable layers. I'm going to make one comment to Tom, then, Nadia, I'm going to turn it over to you because we've got time. This this comment, Tom, you made about, oh, it should be... the the the. The promise of crypto for the longest time was, oh, the transaction costs are lower. You know, I just had to send USDT Tether. It was $68 to send something that would cost me 25 in a wire transfer through the bank. So this the, the, there's this fallacy now of cost where I'm like, where's this cost coming in the system? Because it's supposed to have been this great democratization and compression of transaction fees. And, and, and it's not. So there's still a lot of work to be done. Adi, I'm going to yeah. turn it over to you, and you can jump in wherever you want. Sure. A uh, couple, <laughs> uh, couple of quick responses. One, you know, I do want to give a perspective of someone who's grown up in emerging markets. You know, fundamentally, uh, we don't trust our currencies. If you are growing yeah. up in India, if you are growing up in many parts of Southeast Asia, South America, Africa, right, you would rather find another currency to transact in, even locally. I mean, if you look at Venezuela, if you look at Brazil, so many countries, uh, Argentina, where people are using cash U.S. dollars in their local markets to transact because they can't transact in their local currency because they don't right. trust it. So the one thing I do want to make the case for a fiat-backed digital currency is access not to people in that country, but access to more global currencies where if somebody's sitting uh, in a completely different country can say, look, I don't trust my central bank and I want a global currency, which I trust, and I can trade in, I can accept payments in, and I can even trade locally in. And what is the friction in me opening that account? Currently in the emerging markets, it's either illegal, you know, you have to go to a bank, the banks aren't going to allow you to do a Forex transaction. But if, but if you have a genuine global digital currency backed by fiat, there's an element of trust as well as the element of look that I don't trust what's happening locally. Here is a strong currency that everybody is reasonably stable. The second point which I want to make is about the stability. When you mentioned inflation, and I fully agree with you, like uh, if, if, if it is a country-based currency, obviously it's interlinked to their own currency. And I think this is the big danger that and, and why I'm seeing China trying it very carefully because if it runs away from you, if, you know, suddenly massive communities in Africa and, you know, villages in India decide, hey, we want to transact in the RMB. Anyway, we're importing everything from China. You know, uh, forget the rupee. We're done. Uh, you know, that, that's problems for India. That's problems for an African country. But it's also problems for China because suddenly there's use cases of their currency, which has gone a little bit beyond what they can control. And that has a huge impact on inflation and then monetary policy. The third thing which I want to put in is for me, the, the real change is uh, uh, between digital banking right now and a digital currency is who says you own the money. Now, if I have cash in my wallet and I say I have $500 in my wallet and someone says prove it, I open my wallet, show them the $500, right? And if I say I have $500 in the bank, then my bank tells the other person he has $500. I can't tell it. And the beauty of if you do it right of, of, a, of a decentralized uh, um, digital cash version is that it's up to me, whether on my mobile phone or my device, to prove I have the cash, even though it's programmable and interlinked. 
rather than really saying that, hey, you know, the bank says I have this money and I can freeze those accounts, can pause them, can sanction them, can do all of that, even if so many countries are just doing a simple cross-border transaction. The last thing I want to end on is the control. Now, uh, I'm a big privacy person. I completely agree, uh, uh, you know, with Tom that uh, that if you have a strong privacy digital currency, you want to see a lot of people gravitate to it for personal transactions. But in terms of business transactions, I'm sure a lot of people would be willing to give away control for better ease and access. If you look at, for example, the UAE, you know, I walk in from immigration with facial recognition. I walk out in facial recognition. I don't scan a passport or a card or anything, obviously, because the UAE has taken my picture and it's comfortable enough being able to track me in, 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 in many places. But I get services against that, which, would make, which makes my life easier, which, which gives me uh, you know, government services and transactions. And that's always going to be a trade-off. And I think uh, central banks will have to prove trust and responsibility over time, not just to their own people, but to the global community if they're truly going to try to launch what I would like to call global accepted uh, currency transactions. China may just decide to say that this is only for our people. If you look at what happened to the Bahamian sand dollar, uh, which was one of the first uh, uh, thing, they had to limit the number of people. You have to have a local number. You have to have a wallet there. So all these controls will have to be brought in. Yeah, and and Evan, I mean, this is a lot with, um, you know, again, the panel was on China, but I think it's broader than that, just as, as Adi said, I, I still think I think the banks are going to go their own central digital for a myriad of reasons. I think the staple coin will be issued to perform a different function. And I think a lot of the banks and countries are going to have their own digital token equal to whether it's a pay. It'll have to be pegged to something. So if it's pegged to a U.S. dollar, it'll just atomic swap across, you know, banks just like at a a swaps cross currencies now when you do bank settlement, you know, what, what do you see going on on your side, Evan, within the region around, is there talk within Hong Kong around what China's trying to do with this or their concerns? You know, I haven't been back there in two years because of obviously what's happened. I'm just kind of curious what's, what's going on within the, the walls of Hong Kong and conversation. Well, you know, Stephen, you haven't been in, we haven't been out, right? So, yeah, uh, exactly. so you know, the, the equation is uh, pretty, pretty uh, similar. So, um, yeah. no, I mean, yeah, people talk about uh, CBDC. I mean, uh, yeah, Hong <laughs> Kong will likely uh, issue its, its, uh, its uh, going in that direction as well in terms of digital currency. But at the end of the day, as you said at the beginning, it's not, it's not anything new. But uh, uh, China's uh, 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 currency, renminbi, is not freely convertible under the capital markets anyway. So it's going to remain that way. So there's capital controls. And naturally, it bans cri- uh, cryptocurrency and wants to issue its own uh, because, you know, because of that, you don't want capital flow. But Hong Kong is different. Hong Kong has a convertible currency, which is packed to the U.S. dollar, right? Uh, so, you know, the at the at the end of the day, you sort of look at sort of what is a central bank uh, cryptocurrency versus what a, is a general cryptocurrency. I would yeah. actually say that a central bank cryptocurrency is the opposite of what a traditional cryptocurrency is, right? Because uh, the one is centralized backed by government and cryptocurrency in its advent is really essentially about the trust that is handed to the community as you build the system up. Once you uh, build a large enough community, then it will never go away. That's the concept of it, right? So uh, a blockchain is supposed to be uh, you know, decentralized, unhackable, uh, and in the way that it's constructed in proof-of-work uh, algorithms under Bitcoin and Ethereum, it is really quite uh, difficult to, to, to hack, right? Almost impossible, unless you have 51% of the overall system agreeing on something, which is impossible. But... You know, but then it gets gets into all these issues that you talk about, Stephen, which is, you know, you paid $68 on gas fees uh, to do the simple transaction is really what is happening with the congestion happening in proof of work um, yeah. uh, protocols, right? And now, obviously, you know, most of what's happening in terms of what's the innovations that's built on top of Ethereum or Ethereum-based uh uh, systems are layer two side chains, right? And uh, obviously, that would uh, uh, 
you know, uh, increase the uh, transactions per second, which is what we're ultimately talking about significantly, right? And that would solve a lot of it. Ethereum itself is going to proof of stake. Uh, and also there are other layer one solutions such as Solana and others that would have, you know, upwards of 50,000 transactions per second. So, you know, we're, we're still figuring ourselves out in all these blockchain. The blockchain itself is really the computer, right? As we, as we talk yeah, about this it. Is, yeah. yeah, this is like the early days of the internet for those of us old enough to remember my friend Dennis Hayes, you know, invented the Hayes modem, the Hayes compatible, and it had a certain speed. And at some point, that limitation of the Hayes modem, it just was impossible to go any faster. And, new, and that's how I explained the Ethereum. I told people Ethereum's like a first-generation iPhone. What made the iPhone cool was apps you put on top. And what made Ethereum cool is apps you put on top. But eventually, more and more apps slow the iPhone down. And if you can't upgrade that infrastructure, eventually something will come along. Solano's come along which is doing well. The one that we're tracking that I think is going to do real, really well is Freeton, uh, which just did a, a name change to Everscale. So their throughput's actually higher than Solano is still running on some testnet stuff. And and again, I think speed, all of that's the technology side. Let's let's wrap up with, you know, kind of what the panel was about because we could, we could wax poetic on blockchain and technology and the, the million layers of what it's going to do. What do you guys think? I'm going to start with Tom and we'll come around the circle. Who's going to be first to issue a central, you know, digital bank currency, a CDBC and why? Which country do you think will be first and why? And let's wrap up with the same question for all three of you. Tom. I mean, they're already out there. So you have, you have China, you have basically Cambodia, you have Bahamas. So it's out there. It's just not yet widely in use. The question is who has the most interest. The most interest is clearly a central bank that wants to have control. I think China is here definitely at the forefront uh, when it comes about that. Uh, but also we need to be realistic that just because you launch your CBDC, it doesn't mean you get the traction that established fiat currencies today have in, in the payment system, in trade finance, but also as reserve currencies. And there, I think the, the ones that can really make a difference are the ones that have this dominance in the fiat world and can basically translate that into the CBDC world. And this is something which will be very interesting. However, um, for me, the digital yuan is something uh, that has a lot of potential. I mean, going forward, when you see the number of Belt Road um, countries that are already out there that have an increased level of trade uh, with China, it's a logical step that at one point in time, you don't trade uh, on that axis anymore in US dollar, but in, in, in yuan. And for China, it will really be a trade off because they have to let it a little bit go because uh, currency that is accepted in trade, in payment, it doesn't matter where, always needs to be freely exchangeable. If it's not freely exchangeable and there is no liquidity out in the market, no one will be happy getting that currency and will only accept it with a very big haircut. And that's uh, for me the uh, the next step it will be very interesting to see how will China respond uh, to those challenges when launching uh, the digital yuan also outside of China. Yeah, so Tom, I got one more quick question for you, and then, then I want to roll that to Adi. I haven't seen, I mean, we used to spend a lot of time in Zurich and Zook and Crypto Valley and all. I haven't seen much conversation in Europe through any of, you know, the bank side around this. There, There's more talk around regulation, what they're trying to do in, in Zook. Is there much talk around you know, especially I would think Switzerland is, is old fashioned there. Is there much talk around the banks trying to do this to Europe? Uh, I mean, when, when you have a look, I think today almost 90 central banks are already experimenting with uh, proof of concepts for CBDCs. So I think uh, there are only a few left that don't do work on it. The question is more when do you launch it? And when is Typical it Europeans, they're doing it and they just don't talk about it. They just do it and don't talk about it. <laughs> Adi, what do you think? <laughs> So, I mean, I'd like to um, distinguish between two concepts, right? One is a CBDT and one is a global CBDT. And I think this is one of, for me, very important. Is it a currency that is only meant for local control and local consumption? Or are you truly trying to do a global uh, 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 token that, that is freely available and freely exchangeable? And, if, and, you know, given the topic that we're talking about, can cryptocurrency erode dollar dependency? I think the closest people who got to this was uh, Mark Zuckerberg and Libra, who basically said, we're going to create an alternative central bank 
because you you don't trust governments. Let's give you a group of people we are going to trust. And obviously, they got whacked by all the regulators who really saw, in my opinion, what a great, grave threat this was. You can't outsource central banking to a group of corporations who control the financial economy. I think China, given uh, the level of experimentation they've gone through on a city by city basis, they've already started issuing people are spending thing is way ahead in the game in the CBDT. I'm expecting, you know, uh, early next year, we'll start seeing a lot. I'm, I'm seeing screenshots coming in from people there. Uh, you know, there's the International Winter Olympics happening. There's rumors that that's going to be their global launch to at least try to give some people. But I don't think they are ready to take it global yet. I, I think that's an aspiration. And I think it'll be nice for the business community if they'll at least try. But I don't think they'll be there. I suspect, uh, you know, uh, as Evan was saying, I think someone like a Hong Kong or or, or a Singapore has, has a much better shot at at being the first uh, global country back to token there, but obviously, will that will people trust it enough to to move and trade in that? <sighs> Remains to be yeah. seen. We'll, we'll see. I did something in whenever Libra just came out. First came out, my friends. You know, I knew some of the guys started. Libra to me was a glorified gift card. It was nothing other than a glorified Starbucks card, where you give money to Starbucks for the privilege of walking around and paying. And then they said, hey, let's try and get a couple other people to accept the Starbucks. So I never saw it as a truly competitor or competitive. Um, what we built, and I've, we've got enough time, Evan, let you, what, what we've done at Mineta Pro, I didn't talk about just real quick. We built an actual global currency, but we based it off the old world of barter. So we built a, a B2B platform for a company to sell assets, get a digital dollar that has value in a closed network, use that dollar to buy other assets. So we built a closed loop multi-party trading platform. So it's a digital currency, but it's backed by a company's goods and services, only available in the network to their trusted partners. You know, so there are ways to do it that aren't all bank or monetary based. Uh, and we'll see what happens. Evan, let's let's close it up with you in the last couple of minutes. Yeah, sure. I mean, um, it's interesting. I mean, ultimately, is is what you talked about, uh, uh, Stephen, is the basis of trust, right? Where's this trust coming from? Is it decentralized? Is centralized? Centralized backed by something? So I think that will be an ongoing debate, right? Of course. Um, I don't think I have that much more to add because I, I really agree with Tom and Adi as well. I mean, ultimately, you know, where are we going with these uh, CBDCs and where are we going with crypto? Ultimately, if you look at, uh, you know, central banks, uh, you know, going into uh, their own currency, it's already all around, right? Either they are launched or that they are being launched or they're thought of being launched, you know, silently or non Um, But uh, they're really like, to me, there are really three reasons uh, for, for CBDCs, right? One, uh, for China, especially. One is access, right? You know, this is, you know, about Bank, to, to, to banking, right? Uh, well, or, or not banking, just a financial system, because again, you know, that access is important. It's, it's lower cost, uh, you know, in time, um, and allows citizens to be able to have that access. So there's a very good, strong domestic reason for that. Secondly, it's about control and traceability. Right, which uh, actually not matters only to China. It matters a lot to uh, uh, many governments about whether or not you know you can have more and more of these transactions that can be traced. Right? Again, it's a very opposite spirit uh, to uh, what cryptocurrency really yeah. is. Right? To the community. And the last thing is really you know that is more of a specific to Asia, or maybe specific even to China which is a rely, uh, the reduction of the reliance on, on dollars, right? And uh, if you look at worldwide monetary system, again, you know, sitting in Hong Kong with a convertible currency, and I've sort of like, you know, uh, been uh, in all over parts, uh, all, all, all different parts of the world, you sort of see both sides of the, of the dialogue, what is happening in the West, what's happening in, in China, how, how, what is their dialogue on this? Ultimately, if you look at a uh, global financial system, should it really be uh, driven by politics of a certain country or certain groups of nations? I mean, you know, even I would, uh, you know, argue that a global uh, financial system needs to be politically neutral, right? Now, would you then say that, you know, building that up on these bridges uh, about, you know, digital union or that um, you know, allow transactions? Yes, it would. Uh, would it re uh, reduce the reliance on dollar and swap system? Yes, I think it would as well. But ultimately, we aren't, this is political as much as it is, you know, um, technological. Ultimately, we are looking at uh, how do we build a financial system uh, that is fair, 
when all the CBDCs are up, right? And that to me is yet to be seen, right? But the interests are very, very clear about why they want to do this. Yeah, and mine, and in just kind of wrapping up in our last 90 seconds here, the 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 the, the countries are all going to have their own. There's, in my opinion, there's, there's no more of a Bitcoin maximalist. Somebody saying they're a Bitcoin maximalist is like saying gold beat out stocks. Like they, there is, I don't think there's going to be one central global bank because all the countries want their own for different reasons. And if you have a company, that company's going to pay you in your bank account. And that bank account's going to convert to whatever that country's token or, or digital unit is. And it's going to settle across chains because they're all going to be on their own protocol or their own chain. So I, I think, you know, as, as we said as a group, I think there's different reasons countries want to do it. Uh, but they're all going to do it and they're all going to do it on, on some technology, whether it's their own or somebody else's. And it'll just swap across. Two minutes left. Last thoughts, you know, 30 seconds or so, Tom. Yes, the last thoughts uh, for me, it's really about CBDCs, bringing them into something usable uh, that addresses the needs of people for financial inclusion without, again, giving too much of opportunity to, to exclude them financially for <laughs> politically motivated reasons. And I think it's really about finding the fair balance between uh, making it accessible and uh, treating basically everyone in the system in a fair way. Yeah, the competing ethos of the blockchain or the, 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 the unbanked decentral community versus the, the political government side. Uh, Adi, last thoughts? Uh, don't underestimate the power of, of uh, gift cards. I've seen uh, <laughs> I've seen many economies go on airline miles trading. So, you yeah. know, if you have a standard unit of conversion that someone's uh, giving trust to, that's a very powerful thing in times of uh, where we are now. And gift cards, minutes. And for me, the CBDT is basically just, uh, you know, this entire, uh, entire notion not for local. For me, the great promise is that can people choose their central banker versus being stuck in the country they're born or they're stuck in the country they're working with it. And that to me is the real promise of the future. You yeah, get the, the democratization and portability and access, I think is fascinating for where it, it'll have a chance to rise people out of poverty we've never had before. Last 10 seconds, Evan, and we're gonna shut it out. Well, I'm just gonna say that there is a bit of a tug of war going on between CBDC and uh, other cryptocurrencies. We'll see what happens. Yeah, Two perfect. Years Perfect. All right, guys. Thanks so much, Tom, Adi, Evan. Great job. Thanks to Frank and the whole Harasses team and everybody that tuned in. And uh, see you guys at the next one. Bye-bye. Wonderful. Thanks so much for the moderation. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you so much.